All right. Well, good morning. Good morning, everybody here in person, and good morning online as well, if you're viewing it this morning or you're watching it later in the week. Welcome to the Bible. Uh, We are going to spend three weeks on what I hope is just a very uh, rich, uh, interesting, insightful time of looking at God's Word. As we get started, I think I've mentioned to most of you in the room, uh, and if you're online, you're, you're welcome at any time to come by and pick these up, but I do have a copy of the slide set. Uh, that is on the back table. If you want to make notes on that, don't look at the last page uh, because that reminds me even online, please have a piece of paper and pen ready. Uh, We're going to have an exercise at the end of this session that prepares us for next week. A short exercise, but you need a paper and a pen and something uh, you guys are going to turn into me online uh, through email. I've got a handout as well of some of the charts. And uh, I think other than that, um, we are ready to begin what is going to be three weeks that is built on this fundamental, foundational understanding that God, well before creation itself, determined to reveal His kingdom, His plan of redemptive history, His personality, His character, His attributes through words. He speaks creation into existence. He speaks to his children, Israel, has them record words. He then speaks through his prophets, has them speak words. And then ultimately, in what is the first of the pinnacle moments of the redemptive history, he sends his word, the living word, his son, who is the sort of cumulative aspect of everything that has been spoken and written and pointed to. And so the living word is with us. And the living word is speaking and teaching, and his words are recorded. And so the author of Hebrews, Hebrews 1, would say, and I always think this is great because it's almost like uh, uh, some of you Star Wars fans out there. Hebrews 1.1 1, 1 says, long ago, in many ways, at many times, God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets. But now he speaks through his son. And so we're on the other side of that. And this progressive revelation of God and his plan moves us for not long, also long ago through the prophets, through his son, now through his written revelation that is truly, truly, I think what we're going to see a, a miracle, a miracle of inspiration, a miracle of preservation. And so we have, we have this awesome, awesome collection that has come to us from the mind of God It sits before us in 66 books that we call the Bible. And that's that's what we're going to spend our time on. And so to begin the sessions today, I always like to ask this question. And you guys online, if you can think about this as well where you sit, um, why are you here? Why are you here for this, uh, this series on the Bible? Short, just throw it out. Anything, any? Again? She, she made me come. I don't know, you know, something like that. More knowledge. More knowledge. More knowledge. Fantastic. Anything else? And I'm going to, I'll look on here too if I can. But. Yeah, be able to answer questions. To learn about the different versions of each Bible. The versions of the Bible, the translations. The, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Learn how to read the Bible. Learn how to read the Bible. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, fantastic. Well, so if that's the first question we always ask, let me ask you this. If it comes to just Bible history itself, is there like one burning question that you have? Keeps you up at night. Your coworker asked you three weeks ago. Your teenager asked you last month. The book's left out of the Bible, the of the Bible and uh, we're going to hit that right off the bat this week. So fantastic. The books that are left out of the Bible, the books that are kind of in the Bible, but not really in the Bible that some say are. Yeah, we're going to talk about that. That's a great question. Any other burning questions? We all got them. Got, there's probably a ton of some that we don't even know, right? All right. So, um, hey, come on in, guys. Yeah, there's a table in the back. All right, family day at the Equipping Series. I like that. Come on back, back here. Well, so, so one thing that I have actually seen in sort of this whole topic area of the Bible is that for as many questions as we have, 
Good questions, right? Good questions about the Bible. For those who are not yet followers of Jesus, there's even more questions. Uh, those that are skeptical, uh, those that are curious, and while we, we never diminish the, the work of the Spirit in revelation and inspiring and conviction and transforming hearts and unveiling the Word to those that don't believe, it is just so important in this day and time, and I think it always has been, to be able to speak into those curiosities, to be able with great confidence to build on the trustworthiness, the, the accuracy, the history of the Bible. In fact, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to suggest, and this is why this session is set up the way it is, the three weeks are intentionally uh, move in a certain order, that for most conversations that happen today with a non-believer, the gospel is certainly first and foremost. Me most important above all else we can learn about the Bible is the message of the Bible, the God of the Bible, our response to that God of the Bible. But the most practical question that's asked in response by most non-believers is, okay, okay, hold off on the message. Hold off on the message. Why should I even trust that thing? Where did it come from? Didn't, wasn't there an emperor in the third century who just said, that, make that the Bible? You know, what, why does your Bible look different than mine? You can't even agree on what the Bible is. Good point. Those are the questions, and so our series, the equipping class, is going to be set in an order that says, all right, first, let's get our hands around that. Let's be able to say, how did we go from the mind of God to the 66 books we have with great confidence? Why are some left out? Why not? Let's speak to that. That's going to be week one, okay, today. How did we, really, it's sort of, how did we get the Bible is week one. Get to the canon of Scripture. We're going to talk about that. Week two we are going to talk about how did we go from the canon and the original languages to the Bible that's on the table this morning. The numerous Bibles that are in the bookstore. <laughs> All of the versions. How did we go from Greek and Hebrew to the languages of the world? Can we trust them? Are they perfect? Why are they different? That's really sort of the, the, the I guess, central to next week's session. And then... What I have found is once we sort of speak into those curiosities, now we start to say, this is what we have. This is how we use it. This is how we approach the Bible. This is, this is how the Bible speaks to us in terms of literary styling. These are the genres of Scripture. These are the do's and don'ts when it comes to studying Scripture, interpreting Scripture. And so I hope you see that progression as well as we move each week. And again, very open, ask the questions. Um, I am going to apologize online right now. I'm going to try when we ask this first open question out here uh, to, to check with you guys. But right now, um, I don't have you set up. So any questions you guys ask online, I'll get back to uh, after the class as well. But um, does this um, just make sense where we're going? Is this why you're here? You're in the right place. Okay, we're on the right, we're on the right topic. All right, so this morning... How did we arrive again at the books we have from the mind of God to what we collectively refer to as the Bible? Even, in fact, at one point, why, why do we even call it the Bible? Okay, so high level, general, hope it piques some interest, just whet your appetite in some of these areas, and then we can go into the nuances and all that um, offline as well. So what are we going to do? What is the Old Testament? When we say the Old Testament, what do we mean? How did we get it? The New Testament. What do we refer to when we speak of the New Testament? We're going to look at some timelines, dates, events, yeah, slightly. More importantly, we're going to look at some key terminology that, um, again, even as Betsy, you were saying, they actually become some of the, the, the most uh, uh, misunderstood conversations, even today, um, on some of these terminologies that, that we'll look at. Week three, if you're thinking of some of the terminology around uh, the Bible itself, the most important aspect of the Bible inspiration, inerrancy, infallibility, sufficiency. That's week three. Remember, we, we're, we're earning our, our place in the conversation to get to God's work through that with those that we're, we're in contact with. So let's start at some basics as well to sort of earn that, that credibility. All right, so the Old Testament. How many books are in the Old Testament? 39 books in the Old Testament. How many authors contributed to the writing of those 39 books? 30 plus. 
Yeah, maybe I shouldn't have handed out the slide set at all. Uh, <laughs> so, and let me guess, I bet you know, what is the timeline that the, the Old Testament was written? Yeah, approximately. Right, again, this is high level, this is nuanced. Um, there are various aspects of sort of the timeline of Moses himself and the Exodus and that sort of thing. So roughly 1500 to 400 BC, over a thousand years, 30 plus authors. Now you can go through a lot of the books, but again, you know, you look at Psalms and you see the multiple authors within Psalms. And, and so that sort of contributes. We don't know exactly how many, but we generally see it divided, categorized, the Old Testament in this way. It's mostly chronological. Pentateuch is the law. We see the historical books. Of course, going through one story last week or last year, uh, we, we marched through all this, right? The poetry, wisdom. Do we know why some are major prophets and why some are minor prophets? The size of the book. Certainly, certainly, certainly not an indication of importance or relevance of message, but the size of the book. This is, going to, this is going to be an aha moment here in a moment when we talk about how we came to those. Okay? And then uh, the Minor Prophets. Now, we refer to that, I always refer to this as the English Old Testament. English Bible, Old Testament. It's more than that. It would have been the Latin Bible, Old Testament, etc. But why do I make that distinction? Why do you think I make that distinction? This is the English Bible, Old Testament. Someone with a question who might be saying, hey, I looked at scripture from 1000 or, or 100 BC. It's not categorized like that. Original language scripture, this, actually the, the, the scripture, the Bible, the Hebrew Old Testament that is used by those who practice the Jewish faith today, it's the same. But it's different. But really, it's the same. And this is, an, this is going to be an important aha here in a moment because I want to I stress this. Um, what I mean by that, the Hebrew Scriptures versus the Old Testament that we have today in our English Bible. We just talked about the 39 books, right? Old Testament. we got our mind around that. English Bible. You open up your Bible, 39 books of the Old Testament. You have a Protestant Old Testament Bible. The Hebrew Bible, you would open up and you'd say, there's 24 books. Why did you guys add all those books to the Bible? See, I told you. I told you the scriptures that Jesus used are different than the scriptures that you're looking at today. Also referred to as the Tanakh, the Hebrew Old, Old Testament, the Hebrew scriptures, the Hebrew Bible, the Tanakh, because of the sound of their categories of law, prophets, writings, ta, Torah, the law, Navim, Navi mean prophets. Ilm is always the plural in Hebrew, so Navim, the prophets. Na, and then uh, Ketavim, meaning writings or psalms. So Tanakh, you go to synagogue today, open up the Tanakh, 24 books. What do you notice, though? Why is that different but the same? Okay. That's going to be the second point, Hilo. That's that's fantastic observation. So as we get to those, notice a couple of things. One, we have taken Samuel, Kings, Chronicles, and we've made them into two books. And I say we collectively, you know, two thousand years ago, uh, the uh, Latin Vulgate, etc. That's that's one observation. The the most uh, glaring is the Book of Twelve. What do you think the Book of Twelve represent? The Minor Prophets. Why do you think it was the book of 12? This is where it gets real technical. That's an awesome answer. The tribes, not, not a correct one, but an awesome one. Not the tribes. Yeah, why were they minor? Okay, so what would the size of a book enable someone to do in the 1st, 2nd century B.C.? Yeah. Yeah. Use less material, one scroll. So the book of 12 was one scroll. It was the writing of 12 prophets. So ultimately that became known as sort of the minor prophets since it could all fit in one scroll. Hebrew Bible, it's the book of 12. That's what it was. 
right? The other observation is that Ezra and Nehemiah, when we went through the one story, we recognized that really that's a continuation story. That's uh, you know, sort of both recorded by Ezra. Uh, and so the Hebrew Bible, that's one book. So when you do all the math and you take the 12 out, 39 books in the Hebrew Bible, 39 books in the Old Testament. You say, okay, that's, that's an interesting fact, but why is that important? Why does that lead us to sort of credibility and trustworthiness and continuity? Well, for, for one, when we look at Luke 24, 44, what does Jesus say about these writings? We're looking those up. Luke 24, 44, and really this is the first of a couple of references to that. Twenty four thirty four. Anybody? Twenty four forty four. Should start something like, and Jesus said to them. Yeah. So again, when we to re really understand the words of Jesus, we have to understand the scripture of the Hebrew Bible, the scriptures themselves. Jesus said, "These are the words that were to be fulfilled about me, uh, the, all the words of the law, the prophets, and the writings, or the Psalms, the Tanakh." Okay. So one of the one of the reasons that we sort of came to this order in the thirty nine is if you'll notice the Old Testament that we we have today, um, it's basically chronological in the law and history, and that was a way of sort of bringing it out of its non-chronological order, and, um, and then also sort of dividing up to uh, taking what considered one book was across two scrolls. They just made it two books, and so it sort of came away. But here's a really interesting thing about understanding Scripture as well. Um, this, is, this is sort of the, the bonus um, sort of aha for me over these last couple of months studying this. Um, if you got your Bible out again, one more scripture reference. And you guys at home, look at this too. Matthew 23, verse 35. This is really awesome. And this is sort of, again, our, our knowledge base of this powerful, powerful book. It's really important. Matthew 23, 35, you're going to look at it and you go, are you sure this is what he wants me to read? Could somebody read that? All right, so on you may come all the, the righteousness because of these things that have happened in the past, right? All the blood, the blood even from um, the, uh, was it the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah? All right, without, without us going into the depths of the study of that passage, what's sort of an interesting, what, what do you think Jesus is referencing here? Abel to Zechariah. Okay, you would think Genesis to Zechariah, but really even more important than that, look at the Hebrew Bible. The murder of Abel occurs. It's the first murder in the Bible, Genesis 4. The murder of Zechariah occurs in Chronicles 24, the last book of the Hebrew Bible. Jesus is saying all from, from beginning to end, from beginning until now, the, your, your, your hatred, your pride, your self-righteousness, that is responsible for all of this death that has happened, the blood that is on your head. So that's just sort of, when we read Matthew, we're like, huh, what does that even mean? Well, we're, he's looking back at the Hebrew Scriptures, and he's saying, well, from Genesis to Chronicles. When he reads, so the, the Bible that Jesus read is, is, and this is, I'm really spending a little more time than maybe you're thinking, why is he going over this so much? There is... There is reliability in the scriptures Jesus read to the scriptures we have in our hand today. Different order, different presentation, but the exact same scriptures. And so we kind of begin with that grounding. And, and then when we understand the insight, verses like Matthew 25, 35, really sort of come to life. That's pretty cool. From beginning to end, from Genesis to Chronicles. Yes. What was the Matthew? 25, 30, 2335. 2335. And then he becomes, Jesus then becomes the righteousness from beginning to end, Alpha, Omega. 
That's pretty cool too, right? So the scriptures they had, Jesus has said, hey, you're everything that is, that is violent, unrighteous from beginning to end. I'm everything that is righteous, the life from beginning to end. Alpha Omega. So pretty, pretty interesting stuff there. So, but let's, let's go into a little bit more depth on the Old, Old Testament. One of the more um, common controversies, college campus. Maybe, you don't even have to be on a college campus, but one of the college uh, sort of debates around Scripture is always this idea of authorship, particularly the Old Testament law. As we get past law into history, we start to see the, the sort of acceptance of, okay, the, the historical chronicles, are, we understand that. These, we can point ourselves in secular history uh, to the kingships and the kingdoms and the priests and all that sort of thing. But it's those first five books. You've got, you've got to convince me on those first five books uh, that the authorship that you say it is, is is legitimately who you say it is. Who wrote the law? Moses. Why would we say that Moses was inspired through God? God wrote, God's the author of all scripture, but um, the human hands of that, the human, the human vessel. Why would we say, why do we say Moses? How do we tell someone that? Well, they say Moses, and they say, no, it's not. You say, well, yes, it is. No, it's not. That doesn't get us very far. <laughs> why do we say Moses? Okay, Scripts, let, first let Scripture define Scripture, right, and explain Exodus 34. And he wrote on the tablets the words of the covenant. Exodus 17, the Lord said to Moses, write this in a book. Deuteronomy, it came about Moses finished writing the words of this law in a book. That's not good enough? Jesus' words are usually pretty much good enough. John 5, 4, 6, if you believed Moses, you would believe me. For he wrote about me. So we look at Scripture first, and we see very cleanly, plainly uh, that Scripture is testifying to the idea of mosaic authorship. But we need to go further, I think, in this conversation, because for those who would deny it, it really becomes um, a couple of statements of argument. One of the primary statements is something that was developed in the 18th century, 19th century, um, during the Enlightenment, was this idea of documentary hypothesis. Has anybody ever heard the, the term documentary hypothesis? It's often framed with the initials J-E-D-P. J-E-D-P has, okay, Hollies, yeah. Do you know anything about it? Can you tell us this? Great. That's, so this is, this is the issue a lot of times uh, sort of teaching this idea of documentary hypothesis or J-E-D-P. In short, Again, a whole class at Wake. Let's nail it down to 30 seconds. Um, JEDP basically is the, the uh, sort of philosophy or, or understanding that there were four different groups or authors of the Old Testament law. The J's, in Hebrew, that's the letter Y for us, that sound. They're the Yahwist. The Yahwist, anywhere in the Old Testament law where God is referred to Yahweh, somebody wrote that passage. Then there's the E, which is the Elohist, or the, those who would say that when God's referred to as Elohim, Elochni, or any of the Elos, um, there was a certain group later in history that wrote those passages. Then there's the Deuteronomist, the D, that's, that basically contributed most to Deuteronomy. And then the P stands for the priest, that at some point through the 6th, 7th, 5th century, the priest uh, and, and the priesthood came together and finished off the law that there was a succession of building on a story. Now, um, Scripture always already tells us uh, that that's not the case. Most of history already tells us that's not the case. But if you really want to dig into this conversation, and, you, and we do, we do. I mean, the reliability and the trustworthy of the Scripture is it's on our side. And we've got to speak with confidence to this because that's where the truth lies. And so there's a couple of thoughts to this. Um, that have sort of continued to sort of debunk this idea of documentary hypotheses. One is our cultural understanding of what it means to write or to, of authorship, the understanding of authorship. In the ancient Near Eastern cultures, from the 1500s plus or minus 500 years, Mesopotamia, Egypt, all of these areas, the understanding of authorship was much different than our understanding of authorship. 
It was, it was the transmissions of words through Moses that could be given orally, the transmissions of words through Moses that could be given to a scribe to write, uh, the transmissions of words through Moses that could be, be uh, written down in successive works. For example, Deuteronomy 34. Well, certainly Moses didn't write and Moses died. <laughs> that, that seems uh, implausible. But the word was given through Moses and at that time likely Joshua who finishes this off, this thought in Deuteronomy. And we move into Joshua. So there's this aspect that uh, the argument will be, well, uh, you know, Moses didn't write every single word by hand. Probably not. Probably not. But what we know is that the word of the law was given through Moses. He was the vessel of the human authorship to that. And while he wrote much of it, we know, the copying, the transmission, the processing, easily understood his authorship in, in that culture of all these different ways. So that's, that's one thought, okay? Number two, there are no Jewish or Christian writings or oral traditions, again, very, very important uh, for this thousand-year period of time, we're talking about really from like 500 B.C. to 500 A.D., oral traditions and illiterate, uh, for the most part, society, a very literate, privileged uh, society, but an illiterate mass society. Oral traditions were, <laughs> they were prominent. And you, as we know, you may have heard, when you were told something, you found ways to memorize it word for word for word. In fact, some of the Old Testament is written uh, with that sort of acrostic teaching so that you, the, you could learn that way, you could be catechized that way. But there are no Jewish or Christian writings at all. Of the hundreds and hundreds and thousands of writings of this time period, um, none of them question Mosaic authorship. At a time when, well, hey, that wasn't complete, some priest finished it off, there is no evidence at all in terms of questioning that or adding to that or supporting that. That's that's, pretty, uh, that's a pretty important detail. It wasn't until the 18th century that we start to see writing saying, hmm, we've got an idea. Here in our ivory think top towers, um, we think we're smarter than what's come before us. We've been enlightened, and we just don't believe that could happen that way, so it must not. A lot of that, one of my favorite terms, was built on the idea of chronological snobbery. Chronological snobbery. Surely, those who come before us have nowhere near the sophistication or the intellect or the ability as we do sitting in this room today. It's one of the words, I, I get that from, it's a C.S. Lewis word, really. C.S. Lewis was, was um, he would never read two books in a row uh, that, were, that were written by uh, authors who were still alive. He said, you must always, always have at least one dead author between every book uh, because they stood the test of time and, and because he didn't like the idea of chronological snobbery that what I write today is probably the smartest thing ever written. And so a lot of this was this chronological snobbery that there's no way there was a sophistication. Well, again, this is, this is really the aspect in the greater sort of conversation that is disproving documentary hypotheses at a greater rate than anything else. Because what's being discovered when we have archaeological discoveries, it's great to find, uh, you know, pots and, and how they fished and, you know, little instruments and uh, all of these homes and stuff like that. But what's even greater are these findings of literature and these findings of writings. And so what's been discovered is that in the, the great Assyrian libraries of the 7th, century B, or the 7th century BC, the Assyrian libraries had writings from Samaria that were dated to the 2000 plus. Sophisticated writings, right? This great library in Alexandria, King Ptolemy II had developed the greatest library in the world by the 3rd century BC. 10,000 books, roughly 40 to 400,000 scrolls, sophisticated writings. And so when we think about this, this is one of the things that say, well, there's no way they could have, they could have recorded it. There's no way they could have written it down. So we have to, we have to understand that. Uh, I've, I've often said, too, that uh, I guess I, the, the word that comes to mind a lot is sort of around this documentary hypotheses. And I know for some of you that know me, this is the strongest language you'll ever hear me say. Um, I always think hogwash. <laughs> it's, it's, this is like a hogwash kind of sort of conversation because of that. Nathan. I think, too, uh, in our present day, we think about just your own self trying to maintain the accuracy of the document, moving up okay. in the cloud, and so many multiple different people have access to edit it. 
Mm -hmm. Our staff was not the case back then. We no. knew how to write. And when writing occurred, it was held to such high esteem. It wasn't easy. Yes. We didn't have the ability to corrupt the document like we can today. That's right. Logically speaking, we are less accurate in our writing than they were. And not only to the ability to corrupt documents back then was so much you know, less, it was so much more difficult. Uh, in the same way, the ability to have these collaborations that perfectly fit a one-story narrative from beginning to end, impossible. Impossible. And so that's part of, the, part of this conversation that we have to get. So you say, well, well how did it happen then? I mean, yeah, he, d he didn't have uh, an iPad or tablet or whatever, right? So what did he have? Well, what we know for easily in that time and culture, from Moses, before Moses, and, and, and moving forward, the scripture was recorded and copied. It was on stone, clay, plaster, wood, and then ultimately much of it on leather. Uh, sort of a, a hide was, was sort of what became more prominent in the time of the prophets. Um, how, do, how do we know that? How do we know that? Okay, so archaeological findings, right? But again, how did, how did we know, what was our first response for how Moses, we knew it was Moses? Let's go to Scripture first, then let's go to that. Yeah, that's, that's sort of, again, this is depending on what our conversation is, but this is where we lead to. Um, just briefly, when I look, I say, all right, stone, I think we've seen several. Deuteronomy shall write very clearly the laws on these stones that you've set up. With an within iron pen, this is in Job that they were engraved in that rock. Clay and Ezekiel, and you, son of man, take a brick and lay it before you and engrave on it. In Isaiah 30, uh, Habakkuk 2.2, 2, on plaster and wax, which is also very common. Now write on, it a, write on a tablet for them. Write these words on the tablet. This was one of the more common, where they would sort of put plaster down on, on truly what was, in many ways, the size of this tablet. Put plaster or put wax and then they would sort of do their, do their practicing and all that, and then when they were ready for it to set, they could just let it set on that tablet in wax or plaster. And so uh, we see that. Ezekiel, this is the one that's interesting, and there's a, a picture. Again, this, these aren't biblical references, original manuscripts. We'll talk about that next week, original autographs. But these are examples from period, those periods. And next week we'll talk about Rosetta Stone too. But um, that bottom one is, is wood from ancient Near Eastern uh, period as well. And in Ezekiel, if you ever realize, Ezekiel 37, 15, the word of the Lord came again to me saying, you, son of man, take for yourself one stick and write on it. For Judah and for the sons of Israel, then take another stick and write on it. And so the, the initial transmission of God's word through these vessels, we know occurred in, in these many ways. Scripture tells us that. Archaeology tells us, oh yeah, that was definitely happening. That was that was how that was working. So we, we sort of we start there, and um, like I say, eventually it moves to sort of this this leather. They've been copied, put onto these scrolls, uh, these heavy leather scrolls, sort of things. And we we have this point in time when all of these divinely inspired authors, over thirty of them across fifteen hundred years, thousand years from fifteen hundred to, to Christ, had recorded events, instructions. Scripture tells us recorded the words of the Lord in Hebrew and Aramaic. Anybody know where the Aramaic references are in the Old Testament? Or Daniel? A bit of, because, because he was actually in captivity, right, in, in, uh, in Persia, the area where that would have been more prominent. And a bit of Ezra, Ezra as well, some Aramaic. So um, these, are, these are all coming together, and at about the time of Ezra, many believe, we don't know for certain, but many believe it was Ezra himself who, back in Jerusalem, collected these 39-24 scrolls and books and writings and put them all arranged together as the Torah, the Navim, as we know it today. Likely part of the writings as well, but we don't know that for sure, uh, later, it was likely the Ketuvim by the next 200 years sort of all was formulated with the Psalms and the Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and those, those words of Solomon, uh, Chronicles. Chronicles was, was one of the latest written history uh, documents, so it's likely that they were all coming together. But what's important here is by 150 B.C., 
the canon of the Old Testament, not disputed in Jewish writings, not disputed in Christian writings, used fully by Jesus, Genesis to Chronicles. He's closed the canon himself, which is really important in Matthew. I've come together. So, terminology, time number one of the day. What did I even mean by canon? So that can be a churchy word to someone, well, many of us, and especially someone who doesn't know what you're talking about. Just being introduced to the Bible. Why do you say the canon of Scripture when you're trying to talk about the evidence of Scripture? All right, so for that, what I always like to do is kind of go back to the beginning. Wonderful place to start. The word in Hebrew for reed, a reed just growing by the water, is kana. Okay, Kana, by the Greeks, would be known as kananas, and the reeds themselves would start to be used as measuring sticks, yardsticks. Straight, we can get distance out of them, cut them, and that's what we'll start using to, to measure. How tall are you? Well, let me get a kananas and see you're one and a half of them, or building, and all that sort of thing. Kananas, if you look at the reed, you look at the measuring stick, does anybody know any of the, uh, the, the sort of English words we use today that might have actually, other than canon of scripture, that might have come out of this same word? Think of something round. It's where we get the word for canon, the other canon, and canon, cannolis, the atanellos, ought to know a little bit about that. Okay, that's kind of where all this word's coming from. But mo more importantly, from that idea of the Greek, the kanonos became the idea in Latin that the kanon, the kanon of scripture, kanon meant a standard, a rule, a measuring stick one is to be judged by. And so when we say that the canon of scripture came together, the early church fathers, uh, uh, those of Judaism, of, of, of those protecting the scripture, that's what we can say, that canon became the rule, the, the, the standard for God speaking into uh, his people, of the revelation of God. Everything else must measure against that. And so later, when the New Testament canon comes together, it's sort of this, well, does it fit this measurement, this standard, this rule? No. This is the standard. So when we say the canon was completed by 150 B.C. for the Old Testament, that standard was, was full. It was done. Nothing has been added to that. And then you say, well, Betsy asked a great question, um, but something has been added to that, right? Does anybody uh, have experience maybe with a, a Roman Catholic background? or a, Yeah, John? Oh, this is my setup guy. Were there any apocryphal books by 150? Let's talk about the apocrypha. Before we get to it, what created the apocrypha? It's this term called the Septuagint. Septuagint, I've got, it, got a copy of it right here. The Septuagint is the Old Testament written in Greek. The earliest translation of the Old Testament was written in Greek, about 150 B.C., after the canon was set. It is, it is the canon of Scripture, However, and this is, this is how it came together, uh, King Ptolemy in Alexandria, greatest library in the world, again, 10,000 books, 400,000 scrolls, the equivalent, he was missing one book that he knew of, that he heard everybody talking about, the Hebrew Scriptures. They're not in my library, and I want them in my language. So he directs, Jewish scholars, it's said that he directed 72 scholars, and in 72 days they translated the Hebrew text into the Greek, what was called the Septuagint, because the word for 70 in Greek is Septuaginta. So this became known as the Septuagint. And you would think that it would be Genesis through Chronicles. Somewhere... And they, they became the scriptures that Jesus would have read a lot as well, outside of the synagogue or even in some synagogues. Hellenistic Jews would have used the Septuagint as often as they used the original Hebrew themselves in first century A.D. Well, somewhere, there's a copy of, uh, from Leviticus that was found in the Dead Sea Scrolls, Septuagint, Greek Old Testament of Leviticus. 
uh, that was written about that time, one of the earliest. Um, somewhere, these Jewish scholars and scribes included these newer Jewish religious writings. These were writings from around 300 B.C. to modern time when they were doing it, 150, 100 B.C. All right? For most, you think about the New Testament passages that say that he spoke through the prophets. For most all Jews, practically all practicing Jews, the canon of Scripture closed when God stopped speaking. When, God, when we moved into this intertestamental period where God was highly active, he just wasn't speaking. The canon was closed because these are the words of God. Well, somewhere, these newer writings were found in the Septuagint. These scholars said, hey, we'll, we'll put these others in here as well. Why? I don't know. Could have been an agenda. Hey, if Ptolemy really wants to see the beauty of our people's works, let's give them a whole lot of other stuff too. Could have been purely innocent. Could have been, hey, you know, maybe he's talking about all the, the religious writings. We'll add some more for him. Whatever it was, these writings make their way into it, and they become known as the Apocrypha. If you have a Roman Catholic friend, it's called the Deuterocanon, meaning second canon. It wasn't officially in Scripture for many, many years. In fact, even before it was considered part of the Old Testament, uh, Martin Luther spoke to it because it had always been in his Bibles sort of as an asterisk. And he, he had actually said that they're not esteemed as Holy Scripture, but they're useful. They're good to read. We talked about this in the history class. Maybe some of this is, is overlaying a little bit. But the Apocrypha is now sort of this debated collection at the end of the Old Testament. There would be conversations about it. The church councils would go back and forth. Um, Augustine, in fact, initially had said, hey, I think we need to consider these. Jerome, who would translate into Latin, said, no way. God had stopped speaking. These are good books, but they're not Holy Scripture. Well, in 1544, part of the Counter-Reformation, again, you might have to check out the history class online, Session 3, Reformation. Um, this was a time in, in our, our history when uh, the Protestant Reformation was taking place, and if the Protestants, if Luther said it was day, then the Roman Catholics and the Pope would say, no, 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 it's night. And if the Roman Catholics said, well, it's up, then Luther and the Protestants would say, no, 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 it's down. And so a lot of decisions were being made. And the decision on the Protestant Reformation side was, okay, finally, fully, completely reject the Apocrypha. They're good, they're useful, but they're not Holy Scripture. Well, that automatically, I think, without a lot of serious thought, possibly prayer, there were still good-intentioned people, um, but the Roman Catholic Church said, well, hey, if they're taking them out, we're definitely keeping them in. And so in 1544, the, the, they, the Roman Catholic Church officially closed the canon with the addition of the Apocrypha books. Not until 1544 were they officially in Scripture. So that's, that's where that comes from. What are they? Well, in the Roman Catholic uh, faith, in their, in their Bibles, uh, there are seven-plus additional writings. I've talked about before Maccabees, I think, is a wonderful history. Uh, read it if you can. There's Tobit, Judith, there's poetry, the poetry of Sirach, the wisdom of Sirach. That's kind of interesting stuff. Ecclesiasticus is much like our Ecclesiastes. Baruch was the secretary of, of uh, Jeremiah, and they sort of take his namesake. There's some of that. There's some additional verbiage to Esther and Daniel. Okay, that's what the apocryphal writings in a Roman Catholic book uh, would be considered. I really do think it's worth the reading. I, I enjoy these books, and they are useful to give us an idea of context, of, of history, of literature in that time. In the Orthodox Church, there are those seven plus five more. Okay, uh, Ezra's, uh, the, the continuation of the Maccabee story, uh, three and four, there's a prayer, there's a letter of Jeremiah, apparently, and then there's a Psalm 151 in the Orthodox Old Testament. So all these written Yes, there's this intertestamental period where all these religious writings are written or claim, or they, they make claim, perhaps, to like a Jeremiah or a Baruch, but would be called kind of the pseudepigrapha which is a collection of books that took other people, like the book of Adam, the book of Moses, the book of Enoch. If you saw the pastor, what did you mean about Jude two weeks ago? We talked about the book of Enoch. Enoch was a pseudepigrapha. Use his name, pseudonym, right? False name, falsely attribute to, but didn't mean it was false material. It just meant that that wasn't who actually wrote it. But these writings came out of that intertestamental period, inserted into the Septuagint, 
and then sort of part of this debate from here on out. Here's the key. So the, it's the question, right? The question is, is it canon or not canon? It's a conversation. Um, I would say no on several points here. First, there are 700 references, quotes. Um, what do you call it? Sort of, uh, we, we're sort of, uh, 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 what is the word? Allusions uh, to the Old Testament. All of this, 700 from the Old Testament canon, the 24 books, there are none from the Apocrypha. So there would, there's that consideration that the words spoken to the New Testament authors, at some point there would have been some reference direct or something you would think uh, to the Apocrypha, not a one, even though there's a reference to the book of Enoch, you know, using extra biblical references. No, no worries. There could have been one to Sirach or to Maccabees, uh, and it didn't mean it was canon. just means it was used to further the message. There's not even that. Secondly, Jewish writers, again, early century writers, including the historian Josephus, who had been a traitor and really tried to expose all of Judaism after he came over to the Romans, he never indicated the Hebrew Bible included the Apocrypha. The Hebrew Bible was always Genesis through Chronicles. Finally, this is an interesting one too. I think you have to think about Jesus over and over, the law, the prophets, the Psalms. Torah, Navim, Ketavim. There are literary genres which would have been very important to early century uh, you know, readers and scholars of the Apocrypha that do not fit Torah, Navim, Ketavim. There was, there's fantastical writings, there's dreams and visions that sort of are uh, old set-aside genre. Uh, there's, again, the pseudepigrapha genre. All of this sort of thing that you would think at some point Jesus would say, well, you know, even what was written about me in the Maccabees is what I'm fulfilling. And he never does that. So um, I think the key takeaway in any conversation about the Apocrypha is that it's not a matter of usefulness. Good, good writing. Man, if you can read something from the 1st, 2nd, 3rd century B.C. and sort of, wow, that's pretty cool. Good history. Um, not useful, but it's a matter of its source, its purpose, and its fit in God's holy inspired scripture and the redemptive story of God. And it just, just doesn't uh, fit the canon on any of those. So I hope that makes sense. Again, this is always this sort of a high level. We always dig deeper into it. But that's Apocrypha. And that moves us. So all of this has taken place you know, before the birth of Christ. Now let's move into the New Testament for these last uh, 10 minutes or so. How many books? 27. All right. Even if you're looking at your handouts, that's fine. Um, nine authors, right? Uh, some say eight. Author of Hebrews, sort of the one in dispute kind of thing. Sometimes which James or John, I mean. But uh, I think we're pretty decided. Nine authors. Between AD 45 and 100. Right? Very short period of collection of these writings. We've got usually uh, categorized in the way we see it here, Gospels, Acts of the Church, the Epistles of Paul, the, the other general epistles, and then um, the apocalyptic writing of Revelation. Okay? Maybe we're familiar with that. That's in your handout. Short survey of those major categories. The Gospels, what are the Gospels? Well, these were written by eyewitnesses, close associates of the risen Lord. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John with a lot of help from Paul and Peter, sort of this close associate sort of thing, and others. They are the accounts of the life and ministry of Jesus, and, and this is like one of those, um, pet peeve is a way strong word, but one of these, I'll, I'll try to correct your, I'm not an English corrector, I'm the last person that ought to be correcting English, but this is one of those phrases where I like to sort of correct uh, us and remind me that uh, they are not the gospel of John or the gospel of Matthew. They are, their official initial titles were simply Kata Matthew, Kata John. They are according to Matthew, according to John. Who is the gospel about? Jesus. It's the good news of Jesus according to Matthew. So I think we just, sometimes we just say, oh, I'm reading the gospel of John. I, I understand what you're saying. But really, it's the gospel of Jesus according to John. It's, we're there's not a whole lot of good news about John and Mark and Matthew, other, any different than us, uh, the good news. So, Kata, Matthew, and then Acts is the history of the church. It's a continuation of Luke. Acts is Luke 2. Could be one scroll, if there was one. Luke 2. All right? The epistles in the apocalyptic, 
Do you notice anything about the date, especially if you've got your handouts, anything about the dates of the epistles and the apocalyptic verses of the Gospels? And I think this is incredible. Sort of this estimated original authorship. What's, what do you notice if you look at this window of time versus the Gospels window of time? That's true. That's right. That's right. They're back to that date. But we have our first epistles, letters, before we have the first sort of understanding of the gospel transmission or the authorship of that mission. And in fact, even uh, perhaps like um, John, gospel written maybe closer to 80 AD or so. So think through that. So what that means is that for new believers, the gospel of Jesus was seen through the oral eyewitness accounts, these initial lessons of doctrine and encouragement from Paul and others, Galatians, 1 Thessalonians, and the Hebrew Scriptures. The gospel was the Scriptures. So we would meet in the early churches, and in fact, there's some great um, writings that talk about the early church. We gathered together, and for, for as long as we could stand, we read the Scriptures. And then we prayed, and, uh, and then there was a discussion of the Scriptures. So it was a reading of the Old Testament saying, hey, here's the gospel. Here's the gospel. Here's the gospel. Oh, Paul's telling us more about it. And oh, we heard about what happened with Jesus, but let's read in the gospel. Uh, to me, that's a pretty amazing thing. So uh, ultimately, don't ever diminish the equal standing or the equal necessity of any book of Scripture, particularly the first 39, particularly the first 39. They, they, they are the gospel, really, that point us to the revelation of the gospel. And, and that's sort of where it was. So anyway, they were written by the apostles who had had encounters with Jesus. Letters to the churches, individual believers. I think we, we see that as we read through them. Then John's revelation was really written to the seven churches. I think you'll hear me, this is sort of uh, week three is when we really dig into what do we do with this? If we know what it is, what do we do with it? One of the rules I always, it's always the, the, the first rule of, of uh, interpretation and in Bible study, is that um, the, the meaning of Scripture cannot mean anything different today than it meant to the original audience. And so we'll come back to this understanding of what the revelation of the seven churches or, you know, the epistles and all that. But, but uh, that's what, it, that's just what it is. That's a survey of it. Um, how was it transmitted and, and uh, you know, written down and all that? Now, we're, now we know a little bit more about this. Um, in, in all sorts of history, but the papyrus was the primary vehicle for, uh, uh, for writing down, and uh, it was this reed that was stripped. They were laid across one another. So it's the beginning of paper, right, is what it is. Dried out, smooth, and then you could write on it with inks that were charcoal and gum and water compounds. This is one of the earliest um, fragments found of copies of John's Gospel, John 18. It, it's dated to about A.D. 100 to 150. So right there, one of the earliest of copies, earliest of manuscripts, you can kind of see in the picture the way that papyrus was laid down, which is, which is kind of cool as well. Um, and then eventually they would be copied and used in parchment or what was called codexes. So these parchments were animal hides that were now really smooth, made into scrolls, and they were cut into sheets, and they became what was known as sort of the first books because they were cut into sheets and then bound together, and you could flip these parchments over, and that would be what sort of the, the later letters would be recorded as. But um, anyway, a couple of did you knows. We're moving our time. This is good stuff. I hope you're still with me. Everything good? We're getting good questions. All right. Did you know, I think this is a great one, just sort of a side. This is part of our bonus too today. The largest shipments of papyrus from Egypt, mostly, sent to across the Mediterranean, down the Mediterranean, or up the Mediterranean, to the Syrian port of Byblos. You know where I'm going with this? Okay, the Syrian port of Byblos. And this is sort of why is it called the Bible, right? Other than it's easy to sing, right? B-I-B-L-O-S. <laughs> if you had the B-Y-B-L-O-S, is, that's the book for me. Um, okay, so the Greek word becomes Byblos, meaning papyrus books. So any of these papyrus writings now are called Byblos in Greek comes from the port name. The Greek also then refers to this term now called ta biblia, which is the reference to scripture that we see in writing at least as early as AD 20, uh, 223, even earlier by some of the Hellenistic Jews, 
But basically what's being said by referring to scripture as ta biblia is sort of setting it aside of all books. It's the little papyrus book, not little in stature, but almost like the book of all books. It's now set in its own place, the ta biblia. Oh, have you read the ta biblia? You know, not just any biblia. Well, Latin then would sort of continue this, this etymology, etymology of, of the word to biblia and then convert it to biblia sacra. Does anybody know what biblia sacra is? The Holy Bible, the, the sacred book, yeah. And that's where we get the terminology that we use. And so all from a Syrian port city of uh, this great importer of uh, papyrus, Biblos. But that's where, that's where we get the, the Bible, again. No test on that. That's just bonus, free. Uh, canon of New Testament scripture. This is the important part. These writings become collectively uh, they're known as a collection by the early 2nd century. So we're talking about uh, 110, 120, 130. And they're referred to as the New Covenant initially. Why? Because of Jeremiah. I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel. So the writings about Jesus become that new covenant writing. Ultimately, New Testament. Testament's basically the same word for covenant in Greek. So covenant, testament. AD 150, we have a, a, an individual by Mura, Muratura. Muratura. Uh, he's a 19th century guy, but he discovered a fragment from AD 150-ish that had a list of the New Testament books. That's the earliest known list of the 27. Okay, the Muratorian fragment. You can look it up. You can probably go to it somewhere. I don't know, the Bible Museum or maybe in London or somewhere. You can look at the Muratorian fragment. By AD 350, there was consensus building uh, that emerged of these 27 books being the canon. Okay, so this was based on ap apostolic eyewitness. It was based on continuity of, of redemptive history. It was based on the close associates. It was based on the writings of those who had been also close associates with the apostles. So you had uh, the apostle John. He had a disciple uh, named Polycarp. Polycarp would have a disciple, uh, Irenaeus. And so this was transmitted down very clearly to these early church councils. Hey, I sat at the feet of John. Not only this is his writing, but let me tell you what else he told me. All right, so this is going on through these councils. And so uh, the consensus is affirmed by church fathers. Athanasius, there's a letter that we have recovered from A.D. 367. It's called his Easter letter, where he refers to these books. Jerome, Augustine. Now, we'll tell you that some of the ones that were sort of late to the party, uh, some of them will say James, Hebrews. First and second Peter, it was almost come at, almost like the earliest were like, at least 23, let's continue to pray over these four. And so that, that, that is part of the early church history. And then church council. We talked about the councils of Nicaea, the councils of Chalcedon. But if you remember, the one, they were before this. They were pretty distracted with the idea of the deity of Christ at those councils. They had more important business, supposedly, in the, in the, in the immediate. They did have conversation about the canon of Scripture at Nicaea and Chalcedon but it was at the Council of Carthage in AD 397 that God led them to accept the canon of the, of the New Testament through the Holy Spirit as being closed. Okay, 3927. Really, really important here that we understand that there, there is nowhere in history that men or women or anyone involved selected the books of Scripture. God closed the canon of Scripture. God led through all these sort of miraculous gatherings and, and uh, uh, the preservation and the coming together. The Spirit moved. The Spirit ordained these books as canon, and the council acknowledged that. Does that make sense? Yeah, Betsy. Are there any books in the Old Testament that are like the second canon of the Old Testament? Are there any books in the New Testament that are like that that are considered the canon of God or the Yeah, so um, there are. Um, what we would call these other gospels, right? Um, there's a word for them, lost gospels, right? like the Gospel of Thomas and that sort of thing, that never, ever in history, again, this is one of those things that history doesn't ever um, sort of speak to, well, let's also consider the Gospel of Barnabas. Let's also consider the Gospel of Thomas. These are sort of later revelations, which many of them were found to be um, uh, not authentic, you know, many of them, if you read sort of the background of that, was, well, you know what, actually that was written in the 5th century, not by the Apostle Thomas. That was written. So there are those out there that will argue, hey, we just found something. And then when you continue to follow that story, a lot of them just weren't what they say they were. But the early councils, they knew what was out there. 
right? These apostles knew the right. The church has made copies. Next week when we talk about uh, translations, we're going to see why the Old Testament, as old as it is, is almost perfectly preserved to the original language. And the New Testament, as new as it is, is a mess. That'll get you coming back on it. Well, and a lot of that is because what was going on with the copying. Never do we sense any of these additional books or letters or epistles. These, these 27, and again, it was really sort of the more like, are we extending it too much? You know, let's continue to pray over. Let's continue to be led about uh, Hebrews, you know, or First and Second Peter. Those are really the only ones never like any in, in that list as well that I'm familiar with. I'm not an expert, this, I, I, but that, I've read a lot. That's, that's, that's not what I found, so. That's a good question, though. Um, so, as we conclude, what we've been today, where, where we got from the mind of God of the 66, we talked about the Old Testament, mostly in Hebrew, the New Testament, most, all in Greek, A.D. 350, 150 B.C., the 66 books that we know as God's inspired word of Scripture. Okay? Now, in preparation for next week, and I really do want you guys at home to do this at some point, if you're viewing it now, if you can just get this into me by the end of the week, that would be great. You and here are going to just leave it on your tables, and I'll pick it up at the end. Next week, we're going to get to that question of why does your Bible look different than mine, and how did we get from 150, 350 to 2021, okay? But here's the exercise. I'm going to give you a bit of scripture. We're going to call it Septuagint because it's Old Testament, but it's in sort of the Greek format, meaning that there are no spaces between the letters, because I thought if I gave you the Hebrew and I'd ask you to read right to left and all that, that would just uh, that's defeat the purpose. This is sort of our own common sort of understanding. Uh, but I want you to just put it in sort of something that would be spaced as modern English, okay? Even though you see it, I want you to put it as spaced as modern English and, uh, and then uh, just leave it on your table. So this is going to be a translation exercise that I want you to start, and you can always email me at home again, um, for those of you doing it, you can email me from home to this address, David Holcomb at riveroakschurch.org, and I would love to include this as part of our, uh, our findings. Okay? So here's, begin, translators, scribes, copiers, scholars, countrymen. Please just copy that. It's in the Greek. Again, Hebrew wouldn't have had vowels either, so that might have been a little more confusing. Um, oh, but you know what? The Greek um, scripture, even back then for copying and translating, it wasn't nearly on that good of a paper. There was a little bit more of a paper issue there. And you know, the other issue back in the day was, was really that of eyesight, right? Eyesight was not good. And if someone didn't pay the candle bill, oh man, that could become an issue as well. So I'm not sure if... And we've got the whole, uh, wow, the whole book. This is from Samuel, but there are no verses or chapters, so but we're going to be copying the entire book. And um, Caesar's going to be at the next Roman game, so I would like to get this finished before uh, those games arrive. All right, okay, well, and... Um, oh, somebody did pay the candle bill. All right. Good, good. That's awesome. Let me give you a few more minutes. I mean, all you do is copying. Come on. All we're doing is copying. Okay. Of course, you guys at home can pause it, and you here have the handout. But please do not share this with anyone. Don't, don't um, compare it with anyone. Just go with your first, your first thing, okay? Awesome. Thank you for your help. We will be talking about this as we start next week um, with session two. And I would like to pray for us as we leave. I am trying to keep these an hour. Sorry a few minutes after, but I hope, uh, hope this was a first good start for us. Um, I will say, too, resources... I love, love, love these Hebrew Bibles. Robert Alder's Hebrew Bible and Commentary is fairly new. It's a very uh, faithful uh, translation to the original text with a lot of good commentary from a Jewish standpoint. Uh, and it's uh, divided into, guess what? The Law, the Torah, the Navim, and the Ketavim. 
Uh, it's in English. I'm just, that's a great resource. All right, let us let, uh, pray for us, and then uh, we'll be dismissed for today. Our Heavenly Father, we do thank you so much for the, your word, uh, your words from creation to the words you speak to us today, Lord, uh, the words that you speak through your spirit and the words that you have preserved, Lord, on the pages of uh, these, uh, these copies of what you have transmitted, Lord, through the human hands. And uh, they, are, they are trustworthy, Lord. They are true. And uh, we just praise you for that. We're actually in quite, uh, we're awed by the fact that you would inspire, preserve, and then allow us access uh, to your character and to your plan of redemption. And uh, that we would be able to just look in, Lord, to, uh, to all that you have spoken. Uh, enable us to be confident in your word, to continue to grow in your word, that as we do, we love you and know you better. And uh, we are enabled to love others better as well. Uh, be with us till we get back together, Lord, and we ask this in your name, the great author, great creator. Amen. Amen. All right. Have a, have a wonderful week in Scripture. Thank you guys online. We will see you uh, next week. Thanks so much.